Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Yonit Arthur. I'm an audiologist and strength coach, and I specialize in vestibular disorders. Welcome to my channel, The Steady Coach. Today we're going to be talking about part one of a two-part series on how to deal with daily life and activities in your daily life when you have chronic dizziness symptoms. In this two-part series, we're gonna be talking about everything from waking up to going to bed, so let's get started. The very first thing you do in the morning, of course, is wake up. And I'm going to pause you right here. What is the very first thing that you do or think when you first wake up? For most people with chronic dizziness, the very first thing they do when they wake up is monitor their symptoms. Are my symptoms there right now? Are they worse than yesterday? Oh wait, I think I feel better. And they start moving their heads, like testing it out, testing the waters, okay? And this is exactly what you do not want to do when you first wake up in the morning. Now, I know that it's impossible to stop yourself from thinking about something. That actually totally backfires. You've heard me probably talk about this before in my previous videos, but if I tell you right now, do not think about chocolate chip cookies. What are you thinking about, okay? So that doesn't work. I promise I'll give you an alternative here. However, I do wanna remind you of the mechanism here. As we've learned in previous videos, the more you dwell upon and obsess about your symptoms, the more that fear signal goes up in your brain and the more your brain says, well, I guess this is something we wanna keep the volume up really, really high on because you're worried about it. Now, this is a very natural situation. Again, that dizziness, as again, we've talked about before in previous videos, is designed to get your attention. So those worries, those fears, those doubts that come with it are actually built in symptoms. They are secondary symptoms to the dizziness. They're not just some weird or irrational reaction. So don't worry if this is happening to you, this moment of, oh my gosh, in the morning, what are my symptoms doing? I just want to point out to you that this is going to set you up to then be monitoring your symptoms later on throughout the day. So the first thing that I want you to stop and think about is what other things are going on in your morning. So I had a client who had pretty bad symptoms in the mornings and then they would get better throughout the day. And when we sat down and talked about it, it turned out that she had a young toddler at home who had some tough mornings and she was being awakened every morning by her toddler screaming. So we realized that that was probably a big point of stress for her. We got her to wake up 20 minutes earlier so she would have time to actually wake up and do a little enjoyable morning routine for herself. Didn't have to be anything fancy. She just got herself a cup of something warm and sat and read a book for 20 minutes before the toddler started screaming and that completely changed everything. So think again about your morning routine. You're not gonna be able to stop the thought when it happens, but you can launch yourself into a more productive, less stressful morning routine that is unrelated to your dizziness. So I'm not telling you to deliberately ignore your dizziness because again, that doesn't work. I'm telling you to try to set up a morning routine in which maybe you have a thought of dizziness, but then you have other stuff that you actually have already set up and need to do as part of your morning routine and make it something that's perhaps enjoyable. The other trick you can use here, if the thoughts are really, really bothersome, I have a couple different videos on how to deal with fearful and anxious thoughts. So I will link to those above and below in the video description. I advise turning toward fear and anxiety. So if, for example, the morning routine approach that we just talked about doesn't work and you're just kind of full of these fearful thoughts, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm just monitoring my symptoms and I can't stop, no worries, I got you. We have a couple different ways of doing this. One is to try to actually just focus on the thought. So the example I gave before, if I tell you not to think about chocolate chip cookies and then all you can think about are chocolate chip cookies, if you actually try to think only of chocolate chip cookies for 30 seconds, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're gonna think of a whole bunch of other things. Your brain doesn't like focusing on one thing at a time. So you can kind of hack this process by trying to focus on the thought in just kind of a, all right, you're worried about this, fine, let's just, I'm just gonna sit there with that particular thought and see what happens. Eventually the thought's gonna go on its own. Don't worry, if you feel like you need some guidance with that process, if that sounds totally counterintuitive, 
I have an actual 10 minute long meditation that you can do. And that again, I will link to above and below in the video description. You don't need to use the meditation every time, but it's only 10 minutes long. You can try it once or twice. And then once you've got it, then you can do it on your own. So see if that helps with that cycle of fearful thoughts you have in the morning. So second thing you're doing in the morning, you're getting out of bed, you're getting dressed, you're maybe bending over the sink to wash your face, you're brushing your teeth, you have to look up into your closet to get some clothes. So there's a lot of bending and turning that goes on when you're getting ready in the morning. And for many people, this is a time of also some stress because you're often getting ready to go do something or go deal with some people. So I am going to give you some practical tips here for how to handle these symptoms when they come up, but I really want you first to take a good look at what's going on in your life in the morning. So in our previous example, we talked about our young mom who is dealing with a disgruntled toddler, which I think is a pretty obvious source of stress. But I want you to really think about the dynamic that you have with other people in your house, if there are other people in your house, or other people you encounter first thing in the morning, maybe your boss, maybe a coworker, or maybe a whole bunch of traffic. Some of these things are going to be obviously stressful. And anything that you can do to kind of tone down that obvious stress is gonna be a good thing. But what I have found with people with chronic dizziness is that the thing that seems really stressful isn't always the source of really deep inner angst. And it's that deep inner angst, those deep inner conflicts, those deep dark emotions that really tend to drive things like dizziness. It's not just your garden variety, I'm stuck in traffic type of stress. So take a really good look at what's going on in your morning and see if you can identify any source of conflict or emotion that you might not be in touch with right now. So an example would be if perhaps you don't have a disgruntled toddler who is a source of stress, but you have other family members that you just kind of harbor some uncomfortable feelings about. So one example comes to mind of a client of mine who had a lovely family um, but he was kind of the go-to person. He was the nice guy in the house. So whenever something needed to get done, he was the person who needed to do it. And this ended up being a big source of stress for him because it was kind of his identity. It was his pocket in the family dynamics that he was this go-to guy, but he never really felt like he could say no. And over time, he built up a lot of feelings about that. So for someone in that position, those feelings could be something like resentment or anger, perhaps. So I want you to think about any dynamics in your family or in your workplace or with your friends, whoever you're interacting with first thing in the morning, if your symptoms are really bothersome, what is going on there that you may need to talk about or express? So I know I've mentioned this in probably all of my videos at this point, but this is a good time to sit down with a journal and just kind of think things through. I know that that sounds crazy, but seriously, if your symptoms are worse in the mornings or they're really bad in the mornings and they taper off throughout the day, it means there's something going on in your mornings that's bothering you. And it's probably not just an outside source of stress. So write down your thoughts and feelings, see if you come up with anything. So if you aren't able to pinpoint anything, that's okay too. Emotional expression is a good thing, especially when it's done from yourself to yourself. So it's not like you're spewing vitriol on other people. And this is where some of these other techniques might be able to help you. So if you find that you have particularly bad symptoms when you're doing your morning routine that's involving a lot of movement, you have a few different things that you could try. The first is something called somatic tracking, which is something I've talked about in tons of my videos. If you haven't tried it yet, I'll link to it above and again in the video description. It's a way of relating to your symptoms in a new way. The track that I have is 10 minutes long. It's kind of this longer process. It works really well with symptoms that are present all the time or for uh, persistent periods of time, but you can also use it in the moment when a symptom comes. So let's just say that bending over to brush your teeth is a trigger for you and it's like, whoa, whoa, that just made me feel really, really dizzy. So when those symptoms of dizziness come, your reaction could be, oh my gosh, I hate these, I hear it is, oh no, it's happening again. Or it could be, oh, there are symptoms and I'm gonna watch them, like Dr. Yo says in the somatic tracking track. It lets you kind of describe them in your head, respond to them with interest and curiosity, but without 
really judging them for what they are. And I know this, again, may be very counterintuitive, which again is why I have a guided track to help you learn this process. But once you've learned this process, you can apply it in the moment when those little triggers happen. The other thing you can do is prepare in advance using something called graded motor imagery. Also, we'll link to above and below in the video description. It's also a 10 minute track. You don't need to do the 10 minute track every day. You just need to do it once or twice so you understand the process. And that process is basically just visualizing those movements. So imagining yourself successfully doing these bending, turning, twisting movements without having symptoms. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually something that's been used by world-class athletes for years and years to help prepare for big games and to learn technique. So if it's useful for them, it is definitely going to be useful for you. It's something that you can use to help conquer your fears, which again are amplifying or increasing your symptoms about certain movements. Now, the next thing you might be doing if you are currently working is driving. And this is a funny thing because some people are really triggered by driving and then other people are specifically not triggered by driving. They feel at their best when driving. So if you're concerned, because a lot of people ask me these questions on my channel, that this means something bad about you or wait a second, does this mean I have this particular disorder or that particular disorder? No, it just means that your brain has decided that driving is either safe or it isn't, period. So try not to dwell on what that means. Just understand that what's happening is when you drive, you are asking your vestibular system to do something interesting. Basically, you have these organs inside your inner ears that tell your brain if you're accelerating, they tell your brain if you're moving in a particular direction. Your brain also uses your sense of vision and your sense of touch to figure out what's going on around you, and that's how your brain figures out how to balance. So when you're driving, it's not your normal mode because you're getting very stable information from your seat. Your seat's not moving a whole lot, although you're getting a little bit of this, right? And then your eyes are getting a lot of information from the road, and then your ears are also kind of getting confusing information because at first, they know you're accelerating, so when you speed up and slow down, they know that's happening. But then, once you're moving at a constant speed, if there's not a lot of movement side to side, your ears don't necessarily send information about movement to your brain. So you don't have to understand all that to see that this is a very different mode from what's happening when you're actually moving yourself, when you're actually walking, or when you're actually turning, or when you're standing still, because that sensory information is very different. So your sense of touch, your eyes, and your inner ears are sending very different information in those situations. So driving is a much less, I suppose, natural way of moving as far as your brain is concerned. So for some people, that's why you don't get dizzy when you drive, because your brain's like, oh, this isn't actual like regular movement, like I think of movement, so we'll, we'll, let, we'll give this one a pass. And then for some others, that's why driving is a big trigger, because like, whoa, wait a second here, my, my senses are all confused. So. Again, understanding, I think, is the most important thing for driving. But again, this is where we're gonna wanna take kind of that same approach as we did with the morning routine. There may be an emotional association with driving for you. Less likely, but it has definitely been something that I have seen. I had a client whose parent was in a transportation job um, when he was young, and because this parent was gone for these periods of time doing this job, as a child, this person would worry about this parent. So you could see how there was an association between this idea of, of moving or driving and something bad possibly happening that then kind of popped up later in life. So you may have an emotional association, look for it. If you don't find it, then you're gonna use similar techniques and graded motor imagery to prepare yourself for driving. That said, I will tell you that in general, I have found that it's really the general stress reduction that seems to make the biggest difference with driving. When I say general stress reduction, I mean general lowering of that fear and anxiety about the symptoms and general sense of well being and addressing just kind of some of those global emotional and social issues that are leading you to have dizziness in the first place. So I don't recommend really spending a ton of time on the scary stuff that happens while driving because that stuff tends to get better 
relatively early on in the process from my experience as people start to recover from chronic dizziness symptoms. The next thing you might be dealing with if you are working with your chronic dizziness is screens. Screens are a big source of symptoms for many people. And a lot of this is because when your vestibular system is kind of out of whack, and by that what I mean is the brain is not correctly interpreting information from your senses, it tends to spend a little more energy on the eyes than it should. So I will link to my video on visual vertigo if you'd like to learn more about that. That'll be above and below in the description. But suffice it to say that screens are a big trigger for many people. But here's something that you can try that I think is really interesting. Some people are astonished to notice that they only have symptoms looking at one particular screen and not at others. For example, they have issues with a particular computer screen, but then they can watch TV or they can watch Netflix on an iPad or not. So first, I want you to try to find those inconsistencies because it's really helpful in general to accumulate evidence for yourself that what you're experiencing, these inconsistencies, tell us that you're experiencing neural circuit dizziness and that you can definitely get better because this is a nervous system issue that can be reversed. So accumulate some evidence for yourself. See if you have those inconsistencies because if you do, it doesn't match with the physical explanation quite as well, does it? If your vestibular system is truly the cause of all these problems, then wouldn't all screens be problems? Wouldn't all busy environments be a problem? So look for the inconsistencies. If you are noticing in general though, for example, you are more symptomatic when you spend a long time on the computer, especially at work, always start with those emotional factors. Is this really where you want to be working? Is this something that is unpleasant for you? Do you have maybe longer term feelings about where your career has been before, where you're going now? Are there values and beliefs about what work is supposed to mean about you as a person maybe that aren't addressed? And I know that sounds absolutely crazy when we're talking about symptoms in the context of screens, but this is the stuff that I see help people get better. So addressing those stress and emotional factors and understanding them. When I say address, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job. Oh my gosh, I actually don't like my job and I have all these beliefs that I am who I am because of the job I do. That doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna quit. You being aware of them and accepting them for what they are and saying, okay, I see that some of these things might be making me unhappy, but this is still what I'm choosing to do. That's very different from those feelings just kind of being put off in a box somewhere where they're just building up like a pressure cooker and exploding and causing this nervous system threat response. So, so much of recovery from chronic dizziness is awareness. So being aware of your attitudes that are affecting your response to screens, whether that's work screens or social media screens and feeling bad about yourself, for example, comparing yourself to others in your peer group or friends or family that you love who are doing better than you or look better than you or have perfect families or whatever, understanding what that actually does to you inside is the key to unlocking this box, letting the pressure out, and then stopping this threat response that's keeping your dizziness going. Some practical advice though, your lighting in the room can make a big difference. So play with a lamp in front of or below or behind your screen. See if changing the lighting a little bit works. You can also think about changing your position. Again, we're working with something that's a neural circuit. In other words, your brain has made associations between certain positions, certain movements, and danger. It's possible that actually it's only made that association in certain positions and not others. What comes to mind now is a colleague of mine who had chronic pain and was able to work while lying on his stomach which again makes no sense from a physical perspective, but his brain didn't have the pain association in that position, so he was able to work in that position. So see if you can find another position that's more comfortable for you. And now one more little tip for screens, you can also relax your eyes. And you're not gonna relax them by saying, okay, eyes, just relax, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. But before I do this, I wanna explain why I'm suggesting we do this. So when your threat response is active, what it does is it changes blood flow in your body. So for example, when you're nervous, your hands may get cold or you might get sweaty. That's because blood is being taken away from your palms and from your feet and sent toward the middle of your body so that if you are about to confront a predator, you can run away or fight back. So 
if your body is constantly in this threat response, which again, in most cases, if you have neural circuit dizziness, it is in, in some kind of threat response, then blood could potentially be taken away from less essential functions and shunted toward parts of your body that are deemed essential. And one of those could be some of the muscles around your eyes. Slight oxygen deprivation can lead to tension and soreness in your muscles. So if your eye muscles are getting tense and sore, that's going to increase your dizziness and kind of lead us into this feedback loop where the dizziness keeps going and the eyes get more tired and then you're just feeling awful. So what you can do here is temporarily shunt some blood back to your eyes. And the way to do this is very simple. You're going to stare at your screen, but instead of looking at your screen, you're going to imagine you're looking out of the corners of your eyes, that you're gonna be using what we call peripheral vision. So you can try that now while you're watching me. Instead of actually focusing your gaze on me, you're going to look out of the corners of your eyes. So eyes on me, but look out of the corners of your eyes. And you're gonna see your tension levels are going to drop right away. So if you're practicing this throughout the day, you can also do parasympathetic breathing. You can also do somatic tracking if you like. Again, you can do short versions. You don't need to sit there for 10 minutes like this. You know, you can just take a few moments to breathe and calm and do this peripheral vision. That's going to help reduce the tension that you're under all day and it's gonna keep your dizziness levels lower. So I hope some of those thoughts and tips were helpful for you guys. Stay tuned for part two of this series. We're gonna talk about other parts of your day and how to confront those when you have chronic dizziness symptoms. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, please share, like, and subscribe, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.